Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now I call on to begin this uh, morning session on work, cultural heritage and indigenous knowledge for building resilience. First of all, it's very important for all of us to gather here to discuss on a subject which is related to the identity of the country, the identity of the communities, and the way forward, how we should work together in terms of building the resilience of cultural and natural heritage sites, which is integral to our efforts toward achieving societal resilience. When we lose heritage in disasters, the loss is incalculable. We not only lose the physical assets and artifacts, but also the social and cultural fabric around. For example, the ancient temples in Kathmandu were affected by 2015 earthquake it also affected the local economy around it, not only the identity, not only the heritage. Recovery in heritage sector is much more complex compared to other sectors. Therefore, prevention is better than cure applies even more strongly to cultural heritage. The task of protecting cultural heritage is huge. In India alone, we have 35 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. In addition, many more sites of national importance. India is taking various steps to protect these sites from the effects of disaster. We all know that when it comes to national importance heritage or UNESCO recognized heritage sites, or any monument which attach importance to the culture of a nation, the governments go to any extent to secure them, to protect them in terms of resource allocation, in terms of taking various steps. So we have seen that around the globe, every government, whether it's a national level or provincial level or the local authorities, all the efforts are being made. So it is very important that we come into this platform to look for way forward how we can combine our efforts together. We have, in India, recently formulated national guidelines in disaster risk reduction in, uh, in museums. These guidelines will cover all the 900 museums in the country. I'm happy to share the guidelines with, uh, with my, my co-chair and the panelists in this session. So with this brief remark, I would like to uh, pass on to my colleague, Mrs. Anna Lucy Bangoshia, to give brief introductory remarks. Muy buenos días. En este panel, vamos a integrar y considerar el patrimonio cultural nacional en las políticas y estrategias a nivel local y nivel nacional. Desde nuestra cosmovisión de poblaciones indígenas, no, nuestros grandes retos es lo que es la cosmovisión dentro del manejo de nuestros propios territorios, el manejo de nuestra seguridad alimentaria, el manejo de nuestros conceptos en liderazgos en territoriedad, con conceptos colectivos, respeto a nuestros ancianos, desde la cosmovisión de la territoriedad, un conjunto de planes estructurados, donde sembramos, donde manejamos nuestras plantas medicinales, donde tenemos lo que es la protección a nuestros bosques, a nuestros ríos, a nuestra biodiversidad, lo que es a nuestras plantas medicinales. Nuestras prácticas milenarias la hemos, lo hemos estructurado a nivel de cómo 
hacemos barbecho, protección de la tierra, cómo diversificamos los cultivos dentro de este proceso de políticas y estrategias, estas son las prácticas y acciones que hemos trabajado milenariamente. Dentro de esta transversalización de, la, de los nuevos marcos globales para fortalecer el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030, el desarrollo sostenible de los marcos sociales, el marco de Sendai, Acuerdo de París y la nueva Agenda Urbana, así desde la gobernanza y la, transparentar lo que es la participación integrada de las comunidades en estos marcos y en coordinación con sus autoridades locales. Thank you so much, Mrs. Anna Lucy Van Gosia, for your brief introductory remarks. Now, I have the privilege to introduce all the panelists. The panelists today with us are Mr. Gianluca Silvestrini, Executive Secretary, EUROPA. Mrs. Nuria Sanz, Director and Representative of the UNESCO Office in Mexico. Mr. Simon Lambert, Associate Professor, Department of Indigenous Studies, University of Saskatchewan. Mrs. Lara Steele, Acting Head, National Center for Prevention and Combat of Forest Fires, Pre Fogo, Brazil. So first of all, let me invite Mr. Gian Lucia Silvestrini, Executive Secretary, EUROPA. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, distinguished guests and uh, dear colleagues and fellow speakers. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, and I would like, first of all, to uh, thank uh, the colleagues from UN ISDR for, for the kind invitation to share with you the, the experience of the Council of Europe on these matters. Um, Council of Europe main business is about uh, human rights and democracy. So our heritage work is about practice in democracy and, and human rights, using heritage as a means um, and not as an end in itself to promote dialogue, diversity, and uh, mutual understanding. We have applied this approach, uh, just to give you an example, in post-conflict area following the end of the conflict in Southeast Europe and in Kosovo. And so we have used cultural heritage, um, as I said, not as an end in itself, but as, a, as an approach to rebuild social cohesion and dialogue between the communities uh, uh, that they, they were fighting each other during the war. Heritage is a social and political construct. So we look into relations between people, places, and stories from the lens of heritage, which leads us to focus on two main aspects. First, heritage governance, where communities play a central role in informed decision-making about their resources and their quality of life. This mainly concerns socioeconomic and political inclusion of all groups, including marginalized groups, national and linguistic minorities, indigenous people, and migrants. Second, the role of heritage in addressing societal challenges, such as migration, populism, conflict situation, natural disasters. This mostly concerns respect for multiple identities and dignity of all inhabitants in light of the challenges we collectively face today. So the Council of Europe focus on the inclusive and participatory approach and on democratic governance. But uh, we should not forget the importance of uh, the contribution of cultural heritage as a resource to economic development. Uh, we should not think only about tourism, but also about the different opportunity that cultural heritage offers in terms of job opportunities in a variety of fields. Over the last uh, 40 years, we have been able to integrate cultural and natural heritage considerations in national and local policies through our conventions on conservation of European wildlife and natural habitats, a convention on protection of the architectural heritage, protection of archaeological heritage, the landscape convention, and the most recent convention on offenses relating to cultural property. 
most recently, we focus more on the Faro Convention, uh, on the value of cultural heritage for society, which, in our opinion, brings all these aspects in a framework, in particular, on the important role of heritage communities. This is a very innovative convention because uh, it encourages us to recognize that objects and places are not in themselves what is important about cultural heritage. They are important because of the meanings and the uses that people attach to them and the values they represent. It is these values that have to be integrated in disaster risk reduction. So in line with the principle of the FARA Convention, we reiterate that the community itself should define and qualify what heritage is and organize its, its management as a, as a common resources. This by no means un undermines the role of local and national authorities as well as experts, but, but promotes a more democratic approach to heritage governance. So it is a process. Um, through the conventions, so we provide to our member states, the Council of Europe, we have 47 member states, so we have a wider geographical uh, 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 region compared to the EU. We provide norm uh, standards, but not only. We accompany also the, our member states to implement these principles uh, in the field. So I would like to give you a concrete example um, on the implementation of the FARO Convention. This year, we will focus on the revitalization of community lives after the recent earthquakes in Italy, in the province of Aquila, in the Abruzzo region. We are planning a research study in a few small towns hit by the earthquakes, where participants from different academic circles and interest civil society organizations will, uh, will analyze with, with citizens the situation in the area from the various FARO Convention related angles such as territorial, economic development, knowledge, education, social development, and make recommendations for community-based actions that I would like to address then to the, to the authorities. Um, it is my intention also to present these local initiatives, the vision of the citizens uh, for the reconstruction of, of these uh, towns to, uh, to a session of our parliamentary assembly uh, in order to raise the political awareness of our parliamentarians. In summary, our approach of working with all layers of societies has yielded positive results that led to increased dialogue and cooperation between grassroots community actions, local and regional entities, as well as national authorities. To conclude, we foster a process of democratization of the heritage field. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Gianluca Silvestrini. <laughs> now I would like to invite mm -hmm. Mrs. Nuria Sanz, the director mm -hmm. and representative of the UNESCO office in Mexico, mm -hmm. to give your opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, since uh, Spanish language is not only my mother tongue, but is the official language of this country, as a diplomat, I will continue uh, the effort to speak, of course, in Spanish as one of our discussants here today. Uh, muchísimas gracias a los organizadores de esta sesión. UNESCO agradece la posibilidad de tener un espacio para presentarles a ustedes también nuestra visión y nuestra singularidad a la hora de contribuir de una forma articulada con el resto del concierto de las Naciones Unidas pero teniendo muy en cuenta cuál es la singularidad del mandato de la UNESCO. Ustedes saben que hace 70 años, desde la Conferencia de San Francisco, UNESCO tiene el mandato de ser una agencia especializada en cultura, en educación y en ciencia. Especialmente en cultura tenemos un mandato fundamentalmente singular. Y es lo que yo les quiero contar hoy aquí y cómo en el siglo XXI, después de tantos años, también iniciamos un, uh, un año donde queremos contarles algunas de las uh, primeras formas de resultados para la implementación de Sendai, pero además de esto también, cómo hemos descubierto otras formas específicas de colaboración y de implementación del plan de acción y sobre todo también les contaré al final de estos cuatro reducidos minutos por qué es especial México y por qué estamos en un lugar ahora mismo en la península de Yucatán especialmente importante para esta, para esta discusión. 
En cuanto al patrimonio cultural, a la diversidad cultural, para UNESCO no solamente es la parte fundamental del mandato, sino que, como saben ustedes, la diversidad cultural y su salvaguarda es un imperativo ético para nuestra organización. Y además de esto, confiamos en que ese patrimonio cultural y el patrimonio natural no son solamente los agentes pasivos que están sufriendo de los huracanes y de los desastres, sino que son agentes principalmente activos para la defensa y para el establecimiento de distintas formas de resiliencia. Y además, resiliencias adaptativas y respetuosas con esa diversidad cultural. Sabemos que hemos desarrollado bastantes fórmulas de colaboración, pero sabemos que el nivel y la velocidad de toda esta casuística aumenta mucho más y hace también más extensa la vulnerabilidad en estos casos. El patrimonio cultural no ha ido durante muchas décadas unido a la parte de Naciones Unidas que tiene que ver con la implementación de todo lo humanitario y eso ha ido en receso. En los últimos 30 años nos hemos dado cuenta, evidentemente, que si el patrimonio cultural, que sin esa defensa desde el día uno de cualquier respuesta humanitaria a un desastre natural, estamos perdiendo oportunidades y no estamos ayudando al desarrollo de la resiliencia en las poblaciones originarias. Sé de lo que hablo porque fui la responsable de la cooperación cultural después del terrible terremoto de Haití y tuve que ocuparme y entender desde el seno de la UNESCO cómo no era posible pensar en esa resiliencia y pensar en ese driver de la cultura si no se entendía que el patrimonio cultural debía de ser defendido desde el primer día de la ayuda humanitaria en un post-desastre. Desde luego, para la UNESCO es eh, siempre una razón de peso la coordinación con el resto de las Naciones Unidas. Agradecemos a eh, los organizadores de esta sesión, pero también les diré que el plan de Sendai nos ha dado más fuerza a la hora de tener socios activos que forman parte de las convenciones culturales de la UNESCO. Por nuestra parte, queremos agradecer al ICROM, a ICORP y también a ICOMOS por una labor decidida y compartida que nos ha llevado incluso a estrechar más los lazos de colaboración y poder atender a la implementación del plan de Shendai. Cuatro puntos voy a tocar, que son las cuatro prioridades de la implementación del de el plan. La primera, ¿cómo se acerca UNESCO a la prioridad de comprender? Pues creando datos, creando datos, organizando datos, armonizando datos para que sean comparables. Pero también la UNESCO en este sentido tiene una plataforma absolutamente extraordinaria en casa de coordinación y es la posibilidad de juntar la ciencia básica pero también la ciencia social. Y queremos apostar en la implementación de Sendai por la ciencia social y la investigación aplicada, psicología, psicología antropología aplicada al estudio de riesgo, desarrollar mucho más los aspectos que tuvieron que ver con la geografía del riesgo y que ahora cobran otro sentido en lo que nosotros entendemos que son investigaciones de carácter colaborativo. La segunda prioridad que tiene que ver con la gobernanza. Ustedes saben que cuando eh, estamos en un post-desastre hay una disrupción del sistema de gobernanza y todo eso va unido a lo que intentamos defender con otras convenciones como el tráfico ilícito de bienes culturales y tantas cosas que están afectando definitivamente a la integridad y a la autenticidad de los patrimonios. Pero también nos importa, además de los patrimonios inscritos en la lista del patrimonio mundial, inscritos en las reservas de la biosfera, inscritos en la lista del patrimonio interno, lo que realmente nos interesa es poder establecer un sistema de coordinación apropiado a la manera en la que las poblaciones indígenas, no indígenas, entienden su forma de dar sentido a su vida y eso para la UNESCO significa su cultura. El tercero, invertir. No sé si conocen, pero les invito a que eh, den una lectura, aunque sea rápida, a uno de los últimos informes del Centro de Patrimonio Mundial de la UNESCO. De los más de 1.050 lugares, el assessment último señala que el 76% de ellos, sean naturales o culturales, pueden estar afectados en los próximos años por un desastre. Este desastre puede tener eh, características propias de la vulcanología o puede ser un landslide o puede ser efectivamente algo que tiene que ver con un gran terremoto o, o todos los efectos del tsunami. 76% de los sitios. Con un trabajo coordinado a través de la investigación aplicada de las cátedras UNESCO y con las agencias amigas de la UNESCO en el seno de la Convención de Patrimonio Mundial, estamos integrando 
una manera de estar juntos también como UNESCO con nuestros partners en el resto también del concierto de las Naciones Unidas. Agradecemos toda la colaboración con la Unión Europea, con el Consejo de Europa, pero también específicamente con el Banco Mundial, que es lo que nos ha llevado a poder poner en práctica algunos assessments específicos que empezaron en el año 2016 como implementación de Sendai. La misión que encabezó UNESCO y que coordinó UNESCO para el Patrimonio Cultural, que tiene un programa formativo de training importante, se comienza en Ecuador, se sigue en Perú y llega a otros lugares también de América Latina. Y, por último, invertir. Invertir en que eh, también los planes de riesgo sean casi obligatorios definitivamente dentro de un plan de gestión, dentro de un plan de gestión de un sitio de patrimonio mundial. Y para eso nos hemos juntado y para que el sitio de patrimonio mundial ejerza un lugar integrador entre aquellos cuyo pedigrí principal es el assessment del riesgo y aquellos cuyo pedigrí especial es el patrimonio cultural. Y en este sentido les quiero decir que hemos avanzado concienzudamente y desde el año 2006 UNESCO con el resto de las agencias amigas ha formado a 116 especialistas en esta articulación especial de 52 países. Creemos que es suficientemente importante. Mis últimos segundos para México. La zona donde estamos es atravesada y golpeada por más de un 15% de todas las inclemencias meteorológicas del mundo. Este es un gran archipiélago, aunque sea un territorio continental. Hay dos enormes fachadas oceánicas más el mar Caribe. Y la verdad es que estamos en una zona que ya el periódico de hoy comenzaba a definir cuáles van a ser los embates. Aproximadamente cinco grandes eh, eh, eventos y dos de ellos tocarán el suelo continental en los próximos cinco meses hasta el mes de noviembre de este año. Estamos en un lugar de riesgos y estamos en un lugar de oportunidades. Estamos encima del paisaje cárstico, que es el mayor reservorio de agua dulce del mundo. Por lo tanto, ya ven algunas de las mayores potencialidades y algunas de las mayores vulnerabilidades en este gran territorio. Les invito a que eh, eh, se den eh, una vuelta y visiten nuestra página web, no solo de UNESCO, sino también de la UNESCO en México, para que vean cómo el fortalecimiento de la relación entre la academia y las comunidades indígenas nos está llevando a dar pasos importantes en términos de sostenibilidad, que explicaré después. Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Nuria Sanz. Now, let me invite Mr. Simon Lambert. He is the Associate Professor, Department of Indigenous Studies, University of Saskatchewan. <coughs> Please make your opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the co-chairs, to my fellow panelists, and to those of you who have come here today to hear this. Uh, I am a Māori researcher originally. Uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'd like to echo the acknowledgement uh, of the local Mayan communities. In our Māori language, we would refer to the Maya as uh, tangata whenua, tangata being people, whenua being the land. Uh, whenua is also the Māori word for placenta, that which nourishes our children, and I hope to return to this concept a little bit later. The situation for Māori in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is somewhat unique, while we are a diverse people in all the ways that all peoples are diverse. We are all Māori with one language. There is one treaty that applies to each of the many tribes and a government that for all its faults in its relationships with Māori is committed to a process of settling tribal treaty claims on a case-by-case -case basis. One of my own tribes settled two years, three years ago now, receiving $170 million compensation and a legislated role in many areas of local governance and management. So therefore, Māori have many opportunities for policy input, including in disaster risk reduction through zoning debates, resource consent processes, funding allocation, research programs, and so on. We are painfully aware that this situation does not uh, pertain to many, if not most, other indigenous peoples. Māori agribusiness ventures are now entering into research collaborative partnerships with state and private institutions to explore the implications of climate change on farming, forestry and fisheries. Yet we are a very mobile people. My father's generation began a massive migration into urban areas, often away from tribal territories, and the knowledge of those places in those times was diluted 
uh, often lost and not necessarily applicable to the new urban environment in which we are living. 85% of Māori are urban, around about one in six now live in Australia and are subject to that country's hazards and risks. So despite what would be regarded as significant victories by many indigenous peoples, as a people we echo our state. We struggle to implement comprehensive disaster risk reduction strategies when we define disasters in broader and more holistic terms, informed by both indigenous philosophies and non-indigenous approaches. I'll give you two quick examples. First concerns uh, one of the fundamental cultural heritage components for Māori, for all indigenous peoples, and that is our genealogical records. Traditionally, these were, of course, oral records. They were held in wise old heads they were communicated through songs, through carvings, and through stories. Many of you would be aware that the city of Christchurch experienced uh, a number of destructive uh, earthquakes from September 2010. Uh, in fact, probably still ongoing shocks. The local tribe Naitahu, who had settled their treaty claim against the Crown in the mid-1990s and are currently running a $1 billion tribal organization, saw uh, their tribal corporate headquarters in the center of the CBD district uh, severely damaged, eventually lost. Uh, within that building were many, many important documents, hard copy. They are now in the process of digitizing their genealogical database. You could argue perhaps that the tribe was reactive instead of proactive, but they were hardly alone in that. Other tribes, particularly those yet to settle their treaty claims, may lack the resources and technical expertise to implement such a cultural heritage protection program. Second example is one many of you may have some insight into if you've seen the movie Whale Rider. The film features a beautiful carved meeting house that is a repository for tribal histories and narratives and it continues to be used as it was intended, a community gathering space. The building is only a couple of meters above sea level. It is not only located in a seismically active area, it is opposite another seismically active area, the Pacific coast of South America. So one day, my Pacific cousins, your land may send a destructive event across the ocean and vice versa. There's about 10 hours notice, but you can't move a house in 10 hours. A near field event would have a response time of just a few minutes. Two things. First, the Christchurch earthquake was predictable. Yes, it was a shock, but many experts had expressed concerns about the risks of earthquake damage to the city, and the tribe's own traditional knowledge spoke of the vulnerability of that particular landscape. It was actually a wetlands prior to colonization. Many indigenous communities are constrained in where they can locate and are reliant on often unsustainable designs and concepts as far as built infrastructure and energy needs are concerned. Second, protecting our cultural heritage comes with a price tag. As we assert our self-determination in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have to invest in areas that are evolving and expanding all the time. We have significant biosecurity risks, despite being an isolated island group. Our biological heritage is under threat from new pests and diseases, exacerbated by climate change, a slow onset disaster, and that biological heritage Heritage is a component of our cultural identity. Western corporate operations with all their resources and knowledge struggle to be resilient in the face of these growing risks. For many of our communities and leaders, disaster risk reduction is just one of too many issues they must deal with. The political marginalization and social vulnerabilities are not of our making and require true partnership with our government at all times, at all levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Okay. Simon Lambert. Now, uh, let me invite Mrs. Lara Steel, Acting Head, National Center for Prevention and Combat of Forest Fires, Prev Pogo, Brazil. Please. It's working, yeah. Thank you, Sir Kirin Hiju, for your introduction. Uh, distinguished panelists, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I would like to say that uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, for that I would like to say thank to Mexico government for hosting this uh, interesting event and also to, th to say thank to you ISGR for the opportunity to be here 
and uh, to share our experience with indigenous people in Brazil. And also uh, to thank the opportunity to learn from other experiences those days, these days. Uh, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Lara and uh, I have been working at the Brazilian National Center for Prevention and Combat to Wildfires in the last 11 years. One of the tasks we have in my institution is to work together with indigenous people in the context of integrated fire management in order to connect their knowledge with national policies and the promoting fire disaster risk management. So I will share with you today the Brazilian experience on Haskian the traditional indigenous knowledge about fire use in order to address this important issue considering risk disaster in Brazil and in many other countries all around the world, the wildfires. Wildfires burning in natural and cultural landscapes cause high economic damages and constitute a threat to human health and security. In addition, wildfires pose a major risk to the sustainable functioning of forests and other natural ecosystems. On the other side, fires constitute an ancient natural and cultural force. Over millennia, traditional indigenous people have burning and have practices of burning, and these practices have shaped stable biodiversity-rich ecosystems and sustainable land use systems with high carrying capacity for human populations. The management of the ecosystems and the land use systems requires an in-deep understanding of their highly diverse natural and cultural fire regimes, which are characterized by varying degrees of vulnerability, resilience, tolerance, and often dependence on fire. Based on indigenous knowledge and their considerations about fire disaster risk in their areas, as well as on their perception of how to deal with those fire risks, we are establishing local strategies to deal with fire. Since 2013, we have a working group at federal level in Brazil, discussing a national policy on integrated fire management. This uh, national policy was born at field level. This policy includes indigenous practices, making them part of the national strategies. We are now discussing a draft of this document with many partners at the federal level. On July this year, we are going to start to expand the dialogue through national seminars with academia, states, indigenous people, and civil society. Let me conclude for now by saying that we believe that the construction of this national policy with its participatory process is bringing to Brazil and all government levels the commitment to address indigenous and traditional necessities and interests to the fire disaster risk reduction in indigenous lands in Brazil. Thank you very much. My name is, uh, hello, my name is Todd Kuyak, and uh, I'm a member of the Algonquin Pikwakanagan First Nations in Canada. Uh, I'm also the Director of Emergency Management, and I'm responsible for we working with Indigenous peoples uh, to reduce risk in their communities. If you saw me writing very quickly all the way through, I wasn't just throwing together my presentation at the last minute. I've been asked to be the discuss discussant to try to summarize the, uh, 
the wonderful work that we've heard today. And it is a job that I think is actually quite difficult because we've really gone across a, a wide range here. Um, perhaps I could just start with a story from my country and perhaps that shows the importance of the indigenous knowledge and cultural heritage. Um, there was a search for a ship, uh, Franklin Expedition. This was an exhibition that three ships were lost looking for the Northwest Passage. Um, they looked for it for years. It was part of our historical importance in Canada. Uh, millions of dollars were spent. And finally, they decided to look in, in a bay that had the name in Inuit that meant literally the place where the ship went down. Um, when they found that ship, they praised the Inuit for, for knowing where the ship had been. And they had been telling them for years, that's where the ship is. But because of science, they said, well, it couldn't be there because it should be somewhere else. Uh, it shows the importance of combining science and local knowledge and traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and to recognize that there's a role that plays. Um, again, my task was to try to create an overview, and I think what I'd like to do is maybe a straw man. Uh, if we've all been involved in committee work, we know that uh, they usually get the person who has the worst ideas to come up with uh, a statement, and then everyone else can tear it apart to say, this is how we create a stronger one. And so I think what I've been hearing, and do correct me, and I do want to be corrected, uh, why much attention has been paid to the national disasters and fires um, and these sudden onset disasters um, that destroy and menace both our cultural heritage, indigenous knowledge. The concept of slow onset disaster um, from climate change and more and more as we see in Canada through our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the concept of assimilation of destroying the culture and cu cultural genocide is also a very important point that has to be seen. You don't see it every day, you don't see a, a large scale disaster, but it's something that erodes away at this traditional knowledge. We recognize that a holistic approach needs to be taken and that at the national and local level, uh, they have to work in lockstep. One cannot just come from the top down and dictate to people what they should do at the local level to protect indigenous knowledge and cultural heritage. Um, the importance of, in Canada has been nothing without us, nothing about us without us is a statement that is often said to show the importance of consultation and engagement and to get that local knowledge. From that, I'll leave it and return back to our chairs. Muchisimas gracias. Pasando la segunda fase de, esto, de nuestro panel, tenemos lo que es las preguntas a nuestros panelistas. Vamos a seguir el mismo orden de los cuatro minutos que tuvieron cada uno de ellos para hablar lo que es del patrimonio cultural. Y ahora lo que es, vamos a ir a las preguntas. Y dentro de las preguntas, tener una o dos recomendaciones, cada uno de ellos desde los cinco minutos que tienen. ¿Cómo podemos construir compromisos políticos para atraer más atención y apoyo a los pueblos indígenas? Las consideraciones del patrimonio cultural y las estrategias en la reducción de riesgos y desastres. Comenzamos con nuestro panelista y un Luca Silvestrini. Muchísimas gracias, Ana. Yes, I would like to, to address the questions um, from the point of view of the, of the Council of Europe. I think it is, first of all, imperative uh, to recognize that we have a collective responsibility to address disaster risk and also uh, we have a serious agenda on building the capacities of all existing uh, groups. Uh, increased dialogue and willingness for cooperation are fundamental elements to build uh, confidence among all involved stakeholders and ensure political commitment. Our approach is, ba is based on the notion of solidarity as opposite to the classic uh, charity idea. I think the famous uh, quote of Lilla Watson, Aboriginal activist and indigenous 
Australian visual artist, uh, very much expresses what I try to explain here. What she said, um, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Therefore, I think it is important to invest in human infrastructure at community level with an inclusive approach. The will and power of local communities have to be taken into consideration by politicians, and the concerns around disaster risk should be part of their agenda for election. In this regard, as you suggested, uh, Chair, I would like to recommend the following. Academia, scientific institutions should contribute through research studies and education to emphasize the important role played by local communities. International organizations, INGOs, and NGOs should apply an inclusive approach in their initiative and projects in the field for building resilience. We should provide concrete examples, good practices of the important role of local communities in disaster risk and address recommendations to policymakers in order to build political commitment. But again, I also wish to give you some uh, examples of uh, the Council of Europe activities supporting community-based uh, knowledge and participation and building political commitment. The first activity uh, is called Revisiting Traditional Building Techniques for Appropriate Maintenance and Earthquake Retrofitting of Vernacular Constructions. This study started from the following observation. As historical centers mostly resisted earthquakes occurring during the centuries, the traditional techniques may be more effective than supposed. This simple factual observation made by the European University for Cultural Heritage in Ravello in Italy switched the focus of the research from the original question, what to do to protect the historical centers, to asking what have ancient communities been doing to protect their buildings so effectively against earthquakes. So from the outset, the Ravello research has focused on the local seismic culture as a combination of indigenous knowledge and, and consequent behaviors. The second example of activity concerned climate change and cultural heritage. In 2008, in 2008, the Council of Europe commissioned a report on the vulnerability of cultural heritage to climate change and organized in 2009 the first international workshop on climate change and cultural heritage that resulted in a recommendation by the Council of Europe in which states were asked to identify those cultural assets at higher risk from climate change, promote emergency planning for the most vulnerable sites, support training among heritage professionals, and integrate cultural heritage into climate change adaptations. Uh, another workshop on this topic was recently organized in order to produce guidelines for governments, NGOs, and experts. I also want to mention uh, the recent uh, convention on offenses relating to cultural property. Uh, you have seen the terrible images in the television about the destruction of uh, the heritage sites in, in Syria and Iraq, uh, in the beautiful city of Nineveh, Mosul, Aleppo, Palmyra, and Hatra. Uh, so I, I want to mention here the importance of the man-made disasters. So we have elaborated a new convention on preventing the destruction and trafficking of cultural heritage to help states in addressing many contemporary concerns, including tackling transnational organized crime and the fight against terrorism initiatives, which form part of the core activities of the Council of Europe. We have, of course, uh, developed this new convention in tight collaboration with uh, UNESCO and many other organizations because what is new here is that we have now the first international treaty to criminalize the different acts um, involved in trafficking cultural property. I'm talking about individuals. Um, 
I should not forget, we talk a lot about culture, cultural heritage, but uh, in the Council of Europe, we apply a very integrated approach dealing with uh, cultural and natural heritage. We have the Landscape Convention, but we also have the Convention on the Conservation of European Wildlife and Natural Habitats, also known as the Bear Convention. It was set up in 1979. And this convention actively promotes a participatory approach in all its activities. Uh, the standing committee is composed by uh, 50 uh, countries. We have 50 contracting parties, but uh, we have also many uh, different NGOs and also um, representatives from the uh, academia and, and civil societies. So we offer a platform for cooperation because um, uh, in a very inclusive way, not only in the standing committee but also in the field because we are investing in maintaining a healthy ecosystem with the involvement of local communities because we believe that uh, we need to develop uh, uh, prevention measures and nature-based solutions for disaster risk reduction. And, and this is um, what we call it, uh, we contribute to the softer risk uh, management. So the Council of Europe is also a member of the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, to conclude, I would say that as a standard setting, uh, I'm talking a lot about convention because uh, our work is, more, is, is based on, 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 the, on the standard setting and norms and principles. This is very important to creating a path for strategies and action plans uh, we should recognize that when a disaster happens in a remote area, it is the local capacity, the local capacities that count. So the scientific approach and academic work should pay specific attention to local knowledge, wisdom, and experiences as, as they have developed ways to address these issues over centuries. Thank you. Seguimos con nuestra panelista, Nuria Sanz, representante de UNESCO, uh -huh. donde en su intervención de los cuatro minutos enfocó compromisos políticos para la construcción del patrimonio cultural. Uh -huh. Y estaremos pidiéndole a ellas que nos enfoque cómo podemos hacer alianzas. Uh -huh. Muchas alianzas gracias. Muchas y gracias. recomendaciones. Gracias, señora presidenta. Eh, me quiero enlazar con lo que dijo nuestro colega, el señor Silvestrini, que por cierto es amigo y colega del de Consejo de Europa, donde yo tuve el gusto de trabajar también bastantes años y qué bueno que se da la feliz coincidencia de esta, de esta reunión aquí. Quiero um, iniciar eh, la presentación de algunas ideas en esta segunda etapa que van enlazadas con lo que él acababa de mencionar. Estamos muy conscientes de que esta no es la mesa para hablar de los riesgos antrópicos o producidos, sobre todo, por acciones destructivas deliberadas contra el patrimonio. Pero retomo lo que decía el señor Silvestrini, porque me parece importante, al menos para nosotros, una lección aprendida que toda la labor de nuestra directora general, que lidera el concierto de la comunidad internacional para o contra la destrucción deliberada del patrimonio cultural, ustedes saben lo que eh, ha sido Siria, pero también conocen lo que sucedió con la colaboración en to de todos los países del mundo en la plataforma de UNESCO en relación con Afganistán. A lo que quiero eh, aducir ahora mm, o acercar mi reflexión es principalmente que gracias a esos procesos sí que hemos aprendido que el patrimonio cultural está dentro de toda la agenda de los derechos humanos y que por primera vez, gracias a todos esos trabajos de la comunidad internacional, UNESCO pudo acercarse al Consejo de Seguridad de Naciones Unidas. Esto, sin duda, ha sido un aprendizaje que nos va a servir para todo lo que significa el post-desastre y haya una metodología avanzada que ha acercado el tema del patrimonio cultural a ese cumplimiento indivisible y fundamental de los derechos humanos. Esto por un lado. Segundo, quiero hablar de eh, esa, uh, el punto 17 de la Agenda de las Naciones Unidas. Yo creo que el punto 17 es la manera de acercarnos a una relación muchísimo más horizontal entre los que tienen que producir el conocimiento. Y un conocimiento acumulado, producido, dinámico y en evolución es sin duda el conocimiento de los pueblos indígenas. Nosotros confiamos en que las opiniones mejor informadas son las que vienen de fórmulas asociativas que llamamos academia colaborativa o investigación colaborativa 
para la cual UNESCO ya ha desarrollado distintos protocolos de avance. Los hemos desarrollado en los sitios de patrimonio mundial, en las reservas de la biosfera. Les quiero contar uno que ocurre aquí muy cerca. La oficina de la UNESCO en México firmó hace dos años un convenio de colaboración con una de las instituciones punteras científicas de este país. Se llama el CIMBESTAD y tiene una unidad de ecología humana a pocos kilómetros de esta sede. ¿Por qué confiamos en ellos? Porque llevan 30 años haciendo investigación colaborativa. Tienen un trabajo de 30 años de las 17 tipologías distintas de la milpa y un conocimiento casi yo diría de microcirugía gracias al aporte de los milperos. Hace 30 años ha habido una asociación directa entre aquellos que sufrían en su pequeña milpa, en su huerto productivo con conocimiento tradicional, todos los embates de los huracanes que le pasan a la península de Yucatán. Todo eso ha sido sistematizado para hacer propósitos y sobre todo planificaciones agrícolas más sustentables, porque también se darán cuenta de que estamos en un territorio muy especial. En toda la franja de trópico húmedo del mundo yo me atrevería a decir que no hay una integración mayor que en la península de Yucatán entre la mayor biodiversidad del planeta y la mayor diversidad lingüística y cultural de todo el trópico húmedo. Y eso sin duda en México se ha estudiado en esta integración y en esta manera de entender los dos saberes trabajando conjuntamente y eso sin duda es la base de la planificación para nuestros proyectos en lo venidero. Otra cuestión muy importante, también para el trópico húmedo y también para la península de Yucatán y que puede servir para el resto de los países es entender que esa práctica colaborativa de investigación puede estar asociada a las grandes demandas alimentarias en el mundo, pero hay que cuidar también sus escalas. También la península de Yucatán es uno de los lugares más favorecidos del planeta para la apicultura. Aquí existe una abeja especial que se llama la abeja melipona y que es la que hace capaz una polinización y una forma de no perder cobertura vegetal. Y es por eso que Estamos en una península que tiene el sitio de patrimonio mundial mixto, probablemente más extraordinario del mundo de trópico húmedo, que es el sitio de Calakmul. Pues esa pequeña abeja específica de esta zona, pero sobre todo un conocimiento tradicional, es el que está haciendo que no haya una deforestación sistemática y se le está apostando por un consumo, sobre todo europeo, por intentar entrar en los estándares de exportación. Pero ¿saben qué? con una etiqueta y el código de barras de la etiqueta del producto no dice solamente que viene de un lugar extraordinario en, en, en medio de toda la foresta y este green blanket, no. Lo que dice es que ese producto se sigue haciendo gracias a un conocimiento tradicional. Pienso que es la mejor manera de enfrentar los riesgos sociales, los riesgos culturales y apostarle también a una demanda mundial alimenticia que quiere estar mejor informada. Tercer punto. La colaboración que hemos desarrollado en UNESCO, en el Caribe, con México, en todas las costas que rodean esta geografía del planeta. Como en tantos otros lugares costeros, cuando llega un embate, cuando llega esa gran fuerza de la naturaleza uh, que llamamos riesgos naturales, en, en forma de distintos fenómenos, pues no solamente se están perdiendo los manglares, no solamente se están perdiendo los corales, nunca hemos atendido lo suficiente a un conocimiento que también se pierde y es el conocimiento del primer poblamiento o de las formas costeras de vida. La arqueología de la costa en los sitios que sufren estos embates es una arqueología invisible, una arqueología que se está olvidando, una arqueología que si no también la tenemos en cuenta, perderemos la manera de entender la colonización en todas esas islas. Eso lo hemos hecho en la UNESCO con los países del Caribe en asociación en los últimos años y pensamos que también es una forma rigurosa de atender a todas las formas de conocimiento que necesitan atención especial en relación a, a los embates. Último punto también como posibilidad de colaboración, las cátedras UNESCO. Cientos de cátedras UNESCO con un conocimiento específico y con una posibilidad de desarrollar conocimiento aplicado 
para todos ustedes. Eh, hace una semana, también en México, hemos inaugurado una cátedra UNESCO sobre riesgos hidrometeorológicos que está asociada a la Benemérita Universidad de Puebla. Creo que es importante que ustedes lo conozcan. Hay algunas más en el mundo y están a disposición de aquellas preguntas que ustedes quieran formular como hipótesis científicas. Yo lo dejaría ahí por el momento, diciendo que confío en nuevas formas y nuevos protocolos de desarrollo de relación académica y de relación originaria con ese conocimiento, que sean muchísimo más transitivos, que no son nuevos, hay que explorar lo que ya se ha hecho y ponerlos en el siglo XXI. Segundo, ese conocimiento aplicado de todas las asociaciones científicas que están unidas y asociadas a la UNESCO eh, están a su disposición. Y tercero, no olvidemos esa arqueología y esa forma de conocimiento humano acumulado, que es una arqueología mucho más invisible, que está azotada por todos los embates y que si no se la estudia a tiempo nos puede dejar sin un importante conocimiento del genio creativo humano. Muchas gracias. Seguimos con la participación de Mr. Simon Lambert. Thank you. I won't take Uh, the full uh, five minutes. My answer to political commitment would uh, go back to one of my earlier points, that we remain marginalized and our communities are dealing with social dysfunctions that have been thrust upon them. The disaster risk reduction context is a subset of wider political, economic and social policy policies in which indigenous peoples are too often ignored or actively discriminated against. I'd like to unpack the concept of resilience and say actually indigenous resilience is more like an endurance. We endure colonization, which is ongoing, and there is a classic disaster in the sense that it has a rapid onset component. Uh, it often begins on a single day, uh, and it carries on and has slow onset uh, characteristics. We endure neoliberal policies of social and environmental degradation. We endure post-disaster landscapes because the alternative is simply defeat and death, and we have survived too many battles, literally and figuratively, to give in now. Many of our communities cannot conceive of reducing their risk to future disasters because they are responding and recovering to overlapping and recurring disasters that are already in place. We require political commitment to addressing basic social needs, housing, food security, human rights, sustainable development. The research literature, including a growing number of UN reports, continually speak to this. What we require and what we have been consistent on is the acknowledgement of our indigenous rights, the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Many of you will be familiar with that. I would end by saying there is a, a fundamental relationship to indigenous identity, and that is the relationship to the non-human world. Our landscapes and our waters are relations. They have names personalities and histories. Researchers can mine this world for data, and they do, but at heart, this is a very visceral relationship as all family dynamics are. I mentioned the term tangata whenua, the people of the land, and the crossover of whenua and placenta. We do not necessarily fear our environment. Healthy respect, absolutely. But the lands and waters are a resource base, including for our spirituality, and this is a relationship that is truly resilient. In disaster risk reduction debates, the supposed source of disasters is for us in a relationship that cannot be denied, ignored, or disrespected. I will acknowledge the New Zealand government has been uh, quite proactive in funding a number of research programs that uh, have built in Māori participation uh, from the outset. Uh, there is a national science challenge called Resilience to uh, nature's challenges in which there is a uh, maturanga Māori, a Māori indigenous knowledge component. Um, find that on, online, check out their website, there will be ongoing uh, publications and research on that. Some very powerful stuff hopefully will come out of that. There is a joint centre for disaster uh, research at Massey University. So we are integrated um, in a reasonably uh, secure and stable relationship and I have to acknowledge that that is a, an expression of political commitment that would be uh, wonderful and, and empowering to see replicated uh, around the United Nations. Thank you. Seguimos con Lara 
Let us turn. Muchas gracias, Ana Lucia. Uh, regarding to wildfires, uh, it's important to focus my answer in three main points. The first one is uh, climate change is one of the drivers of uh, disaster risk, influencing directly the increase of wildfires and its damages. Fire today is completely different from the past. Fire, regime, fire reg regimes are changing and we have to find a way to reduce vulnerability to fire disasters and strengthen resilience to the fires of the present. My second point is that wildfires are threatening livelihood and environment. The exposure of indigenous people to uncontrolled fires is threatening their health. It's threatening their food security and the way they live, since their lives are linked, closely linked to the nature, which provide the most part of their necessities. It's also important to notice that uh, in Brazil, indigenous lands have double function. Indigenous lands preserve cultural heritage and also promote environmental conservation. 13% of Brazilian territory is covered by indigenous lands. When we see a map of natural vegetation in Brazil, we can observe that the indigenous lands are natural preserved environments, highlighting this double role of indigenous land, cultural and environmental conservation provided an environmental service, not only for indigenous people, for, but also for the whole world. My third point is, understanding fire as a disaster risk and its close relationship with the climate change and land use change, it becomes clear that we have to build local capacities for local actions and it's necessary to ensure the use of traditional, indigenous, and local knowledge, because they can contribute significantly to find solutions. It's a way to work hand-to-hand -hand with communities. I think that uh, these three points are bringing more attention and support to indigenous people, politicians, policymakers, and technicians are more and more aware of the important role of indigenous people and their knowledge, and the necessity of establishing dialogues and the participatory process with them. We have been working with indigenous people in the context of integrated fire management, as I said before. Based on traditional knowledge about fire use and the knowledge of indigenous people on the area where they live, we are establishing a more natural fire regime in their areas. Through the use of prescribed burnings, we are using fire to prevent fire disaster. With uh, these strategies, we are promoting disaster risk management, improving environmental services of the ecosystems and reducing the risk of a fire disaster. It's also interesting to notice that this process we are carrying on is promoting the empowerment of the communities with their own knowledge. Many youngers in indigenous communities are losing the traditional knowledge because they are not anymore interested in listening to the elders. According to an, an elder from Xingu indigenous land in Brazil, youngers are much more interested on cell phones and Facebook than on learning how to manage their own lands. It's okay for them to have cell phones and Facebook, but they have also to take care of their lands. This is important for them. With the process we are carrying on, youngers are noticing that those ancient knowledge, traditional knowledge, can help to solve problems they are facing today. 
It's a process of valorization of indigenous knowledge, what is trending, the disaster risk governance of indigenous people to manage risk in their areas, in their own territories. In order to respond directly to fire events because they still occur, we also have an indigenous brigade program. Through capacity building at local level, we guarantee that in the case of an uncontrolled fire, indigenous people is able to fight against fire because of training and equipment they received. This is a very brief resume of the issue and how we are dealing with it in Brazil. To finish uh, my intervention now, I would like to point out that the most important challenge in this process which, uh, and that which should drive actions in the future is to bring together, as my colleague Gianluca said, in close connection, indigenous people and their knowledge with scientific knowledge and also with national and local strategies and the policies. Fire regimes, as I said before, are changing. Traditional knowledge is a dynamic process also, for sure. But sometimes the socio-economical and climate change can overlap the adaptation of traditional knowledge to the new environment contexts. Bringing together science and indigenous knowledge can help to develop new practices adapted to new realities. So my recommendation is just this one, bring together science and knowledge and indigenous knowledge. In addition to that, it's important to respect cultural diversity and knowledge. And this can make a mix of science, indigenous, and respect for every information that we can get. And so we can construct a new way where we are promoting cultural heritage conservation and also environmental conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Now, uh, our learned panelists have made very crucial and important recommendations. And uh, besides that, our discussion, Todd Quack also has made his recommendations. So now, I will just quickly try to make brief uh, summarization of the recommendations you have made. Uh, first of all, uh, it has been widely considered to take a holistic view of protecting the cultural heritage. This includes going beyond the protection of physical objects to include issues of economic development, community participation, dialogue, and diversity. The second recommendation, what I, I would like to summarize is recognize, we have to recognize those non-tangible heritage such as uh, cultural diversity, especially the indigenous culture practices and the traditional knowledge as a source of our resilience. As such, it needs to be protected as much as tangible heritage. In the aftermath of disaster, restoration of cultural heritage should be prioritized and not put on the back burner till all other sectors have achieved full recovery. The indigenous people should be given an active role to play, and their input must be taken in the policy making for disaster risk reduction. The, rec uh, the recommendation which I would like to highlight one more is the role of the traditional, which I have emphasized, in sustainable use of natural resources that must be fully integrated in the modern ways, which most of you have mentioned it, in protecting our natural heritage. The final point I would like to add is we must ensure proper resource mobilization and investment to build the capacity in the preservation of cultural heritage sites. So with this, uh, the summarization of the recommendations, I would be honored to release the 
uh, book, the unveil the book on the guidelines, National Disaster Management Guidelines, which we have uh, uh, got it ready. I would ask, request my fellow panelist members to join me in releasing this book. Una recomendación que nos quedó pendiente es sobre la promoción e integración del conocimiento indígena y tradicional en las políticas, programas e iniciativas de reducción de riesgo y desastre. So uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of this very important session. I thank my co-chair and all the learned panelists, the questioners, and the, the learned audience here for the uh, participation in this very important session. Thank you so much.